welcome. I've tried to stand without your power, build my house on sand. How you guys doing? Good to be back, right? Um, <laughs> Paul, that was so funny. We're like, we're singing the song, I'll be the only one standing. And like, we're all sitting down. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. Um, well, hey, it's, it's Table Church. It's supposed to be a little more uh, low-key, relaxing, and we're also going to try to social distance, sort of, with uh, these tables. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, and really what I want us to do is I want us to take a quick moment and I want us to, to soak in this moment. I want us to soak in this moment because I know there's a few of us here. and We have a larger audience, I'm sure, tuning in online right now. But this, I believe, is a mustard seed moment. A mustard seed starts out small. And a mustard seed is seemingly insignificant, but it grows to be something incredibly significant. And I believe that God is in the midst. He has been in the midst the last three months of us not meeting. Um, I believe he's redeeming. I believe, he, I believe he's working. And he's doing something new in the church. 
I believe how we function as the church and how the, the body of Christ goes and, and is mobilized in mission, um, I believe God's kind of changed up the game. Uh, and I'll talk more about that here in my message, but um, I'm just so excited for this new season. Uh, hey, before we get going talking about maybe some of the dynamics or how I kind of feel God is prompting and mobilizing and equipping the church at this time, I just want to highlight a couple changes. Um, one change is, is talking a little bit about the physical changes in the building, uh, and the other set of changes will be some small practical procedure-based changes that we're going to hopefully observe to the best of our ability for the time being. Um, as you can see, uh, when you guys walking in here this morning, that, that there's been some changes to the building. Uh, we've been busy contacting and keeping people connected in this time with phone trees and Zoom and small groups and, and trying to keep people connected online and our live streaming. But there's been a few small work crews and parties that have kind of tried to make some changes here as well. So I want to just uh, let you guys know that we were strategic and frugal in all that we did. And I want to just thank so many people that donated and, and generously gave of their time and their resources and finances to throw some paint on the walls, to um, polish the concrete, which is such a great cost-effective decision based off of the hallways and entryway. And with polished carpet, we don't have to spend money to, you know, maintain it or to replace it, so that's been sweet. Um, we were able to kind of decorate the, the fellowship hall and just kind of revamp that space to make it feel more of a family room, and uh, actually, first week of July, we, we're going to be carpeting this whole area of what's remaining in the flooring fund that we've been raising up, and just so, so thrilled about the changes, and I just want to th say thank you so much to everybody that's, that's been working on this. Uh, also, some small practical procedure-based changes. Uh, I'll, I'll list a couple, but um, the heart of some of these procedures is that we want to honor some recommendations while still functioning as a family of God in fellowship and in worship. So we're going to do our, our best just to be considerate and cautious with one another because, um, you know, there still is that, that, that threat and that opportunity and, and possibility of, you know, contracting uh, COVID-19. So we just want to do all that we can to be smart um, while being excited uh, that we get to worship together. And so we want to eliminate as many commonly touched surfaces as possible, which is why I'm asking everybody, if you are physically able to, to walk through the front doors, the main doors, um, that way we're not having multiple hands touch multiple services. Uh, our job is really to extensively clean since we are hosting church as well as online church. So if you guys can go through the main doors, that would be just fabulous. That would really help us out a lot. Um, that's why we're not passing out bulletins either. Uh, that's why communion is set up at your table. Um, that's why we have a green sticker cup and a red sticker cup. Green meaning those are clean pens. Red sticker means that you've used the pen, so you can just put the pens in the red sticker cup. Uh, we have uh, little connection cards and optional attendance cards at the tables as well. Um, and that's also why we're on a strict BYOC protocol. Bring your own coffee to church as Papa Jack raises up his to-go mug. Uh, we'll have coffee here sometime in the future, but right now we're just asking that you bring your own coffee. Um, and as far as masks, I would love it if everybody would have a mask on them. I know I'm, I'm carrying a mask right now. And for those who walk in here and you see them wearing a mask, you see them a little bit cautious, um, put your mask up consider where they're at, be the first one to lay down your convenience and to lay down your freedom to best serve and love uh, your neighbor. So that's just what I'm asking. Let's just be smart, but also let's, let's be excited that we get to worship together. So let me pray over us, and then the, the worship team will take us away. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are uh, the author and perfecter of faith, that you are the Alpha and Omega you are the beginning and the end. Um, and we believe that in every season, no matter its triumphs and no matter its tragedies, uh, no matter the, the suffering or the discomfort or, the, um, <laughs> or just how odd maybe a season may look or feel, you are in the midst of every season and you supply in us supernatural strength to get through every season. We thank you. Uh, just where you've taken us individually, where you've taken Laurel Church collectively, where you have taken the church globally at this time. I really believe you are moving and equipping and mobilizing the church to minister in new ways, to, to see with fresh eyes, and to have the hearts that are open to, to change and open to um, really embrace the opportunity to love uh, our neighbors. 
God, we thank you for this time. I just pray that these aren't just moments of worship, but that these are moments of life change as we worship you. God, may this be real, genuine moments of worship here this morning. Thank you so much for the worship team. Thank you for the songs that we're going to sing. And we're just so thankful for you, Jesus. In your name, all God's people say, amen. Let's continue to worship.
waters of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Amen. So good to be back. So good to have you back. I guess we've been back, but it doesn't feel like it. It's not the same without you. It's morning, right? 
I got that confused at the evening service last night. I'm like, good morning, everybody. Wait a minute. No. It's, it's definitely 7 p.m. here. Well, good morning. Good morning. How, how are you doing? Just all at once. I can hear everything all at once. Tell me how you are. One, two, three, go. Yeah, I didn't catch any of that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're here. We're here. We've had some of the, some of the church fam uh, come last night. Uh, some more of you guys are here today. We have some double dippers. We got some people that went last night here this morning. Hey, I needed to come back this morning too, partly because I have to preach, but I, I just miss church too. So um, it's just so good to see you guys. I know that there's plenty of people watching online too. And, and we're just for the uh, foreseeable future or oh, really f- for a long, long time, our, our hope is to continue with live in-person services and uh, streaming it online too. So if you are ever not feeling well, um, if you're ever on the fence or you have conflicting plans, you're out of town, you can still catch a service and uh, we'll continue to publish it and post it um, not only on our Facebook page but on YouTube. If you type in Laurel Church Bellingham, you're going to be able to find our YouTube channel. You can actually subscribe and, and continue to watch messages and updates and uh, and then we'll post it on the, the website as well. So, so thankful that you guys are here this morning. Um, we're going to we're going to dive into a passage uh, this morning, um, and it's going to be a different take uh, than what we've been talking about the last few weeks when it comes to the Beatitudes. We've been preaching about our, uh, our you know, our hashtag blessed uh, series, talking about the Beatitudes, blessed are the, and, and that's been amazing. Uh, and actually, in a couple weeks, uh, I'll be out of town just with uh, some family trip plans. Uh, so uh, Carl is going to be preaching July 5th, Sunday, July 5th. We're excited for you all to hear from him. Um, he, he's, he's doing a blessed are the pure in heart, and he <laughs> I just had a conversation last night. He's like, why did you give me that topic? I'm not pure in heart. I'm like, well, maybe that's why you got to study it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's going to be amazing. I'm excited for you to hear from Carl, and then the next week, uh, Charlie Smith's going to be preaching for me as well. I'll come back, and I'll preach uh, another week, and then ac- there's actually going to be a pastor from a church in Everson. Uh, I went to school with him. He's, he's one of my dear friends, uh, and he, he's going to be filling in the first weekend of August as well, wrapping up our Hashtag Bless series. So we're going to be able to hear from a different, uh, some different voices as we talk about that series, but I'm going to be breaking from that series this weekend and next weekend because I want us to think about um, where God has brought the church up until this point, uh, how God is using and working and redeeming uh, what's been the last few months of not being in the church building. Uh, I know we're so excited to be here. I'm pumped to worship with a few more people here this morning. But I, I believe that the church has been outside the building um, for a specific purpose. Uh, I believe God is equipping and mobilizing the church in wonderful, new, challenging ways. And so this week and the next weekend, my, my, my two-week series is called Rethinking Church. Rethinking Church. And today's uh, title for this message is We Must Go Down the Mountain. So if you're a note taker, I know a few of you guys are, um, We Must Go Down the Mountain. Uh, will be the, the title of, of this message. Last night, I preached in a particular angle uh, in Mark 9 about when Jesus and Peter, James, and John went up the mountain, and Jesus was transfigured and transformed in their very midst. Um, and so last night was a good message. I felt like I tried to communicate what God was putting on my heart, what he was showing me, what he was challenging me in. Um, over the course of last night and this morning, I just really felt like God showed me uh, a different angle to take on the same text. And that's the beauty of having the word that is alive and active, (laughs) that divides, that pierces, that's accurate. Um, That's the wonderful thing about having the Holy Spirit, our our advocate, our comforter, our teacher. Uh, We can read the same text, and there's, it's like a diamond, right? There's different angles. That's how dynamic and how big and how beautiful our God is. Uh, and how active and alive the Spirit of God is revealing truths and mysteries in the Word of God. So we're going to take a different angle this morning, and uh, we're going to be actually in Matthew. So if you want to turn a little bit to the end of Matthew chapter 16 and the beginning of Matthew chapter 17, um, again, the goal is to rethink church. How does this apply to the church? How can this apply to me individually? as a member of the church, and how can this apply to the body of Christ, the capital C, church? 
we are rethinking church. Um, before we do that, I would just love if we could pray for a moment this morning before we dig in. Lord God, we just silent, um, we silence and quiet our souls before you. There's so much noise just around us in society. So many voices, so many opinions, so much hurt, so much pain. And God, we just, we just silence and, and rest our souls before you. Um, you are our refuge our strength. And God, I just ask that this is not a time that we gain more information, but that through the information we take in, that that leads to life transformation. God, may what we talk about this morning and what we read in the scriptures this morning, may that make the, the journey from our head to our hearts. God, I just... I ask that you are just working in powerful ways this morning as we elevate you, Jesus. In your name, we pray. Amen. Have you guys ever wished that you can just take a shortcut? <laughs> I mean, that is much of the human plight right there, right? Um, my, my, my Iron Man race was supposed to be um, next weekend, it got postponed to September 6th. So if you guys aren't doing anything September 6th, you can drive to Coeur d'Alene, Coeur d'Alene, and you can see your pastor in, in the most pain um, ever, um, swimming and cycling and running. Um, I just have that crazy competitive itch. I just got a scratch, and so I signed up for this. I'm training, but there's so many days I wish I can take a shortcut. Um, I wish I can do what needs to be done in order to complete that race, eating donuts, <laughs> sitting on the couch, watching TV, um, eating Lucky Charms, that's Jamie's favorite cereal, Lucky Charms, Fruit Loops, and I'm like, Daddy wants to join you and eat some Fruit Loops. I wish I could take a shortcut, but I know that if in order really to run that race, I, I can't be taking shortcuts. Um, you know, Paul even talks about that to, to Timothy. He said, hey, physical training's good. It's of some value, uh, but training for godliness, that's, that's the kind of fruit you want to see in your life. And so, I know that I gotta be training, I gotta be disciplined, but shortcuts, um, though they're easy in the moment and so tempting in the moment, um, it robs you of so much opportunity. It robs you of the fullness of, I really believe, God's plans and purposes for our life and plans and purposes in specific moments day to day. Uh, shortcuts, that's, that's the cop out, the easy way out, and, it, and, and I'm honestly facing that on a day to day basis when it comes to physically training for the Iron Man, but in so many ways. In so many ways. And here I want to talk about kind of the shortcut that I really believe that Peter was, was thinking when he was talking with Jesus. And, and so much of, of Peter's upbringing, the lens of being a Hebrew, the lens of being an Israelite, the lens of longing for the, the Messiah to come. I mean, Israel had a certain idea of the Messiah. They had a certain idea of how it would go down. They had a certain idea of how the kingdom of Israel would be, would be strong, how, how the Messiah would deliver Israel, and how the kingdom of God would be in their midst. And they had a, a particular idea or inclination of what that may look like physically, nationally. Uh, so Jesus, he just continued to blow, them, blow their minds, like just blow it out of the water when he was talking about not so much the physical, national sense of this deliverance, this freedom, but a spiritual sense of this freedom, this deliverance. And so Peter is kind of working somewhat under, I mean, probably good intentions, longing for the Messiah, but somewhat of a misunderstanding of, of how these things would go down. And he kind of talks about Jesus, or talks to Jesus about a shortcut. Um, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 16, and, and kind of the, the meat of the burger, so to speak, is going to be the Mount of Transfiguration. But I want to kind of dabble in some the, of the buns, the lettuce, the tomatoes, as we kind of get our way to the meat this morning. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 13, uh, that's kind of the, the beginning of a section where 
where Peter says something profound. Peter makes a proclamation. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's Jesus' question to every single person. Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, Jesus was talking to Peter, Peter meaning rock, or, or very similarly in how it sounded, meaning rock. But, but I really believe that, that Jesus was saying, Peter, upon the statement that you just said, that I am the Christ, that is the rock, the foundation, the bedrock of which I'm going to build this church. Peter right here, he got it. Not because of flesh and blood, not because of his own ability to perceive or his own ability to understand. He got it because the Father in heaven revealed it to him, saying, this is Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. There's this moment of revelation, this moment where they, he got it. And Jesus pumped him up, saying, yes, this has been revealed to you. Come on. This is the statement, this is the truth, this is the reality that serves as the bedrock and the foundation of which I'm going to build my church. And nothing will prevail against it. Nothing will overcome it, even the gates of hell. Shortly after Peter gets it, Jesus talks about something that's like, wait, wait, what? And he kind of throws the disciples for a loop, but he foretells of his death and resurrection. In verse 21, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Um, imagine rebuking Jesus. <laughs> um, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Uh, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. I'm going to imagine having Jesus say, boom, that's it. Good job. God's revealed this to you. And then shortly after, get behind me, Satan. Be like, wait, what? <laughs> get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. See what Peter was trying to do, I, I believe, Peter, in good intention, he didn't want Jesus to suffer. That, that Peter knew that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. So, so Jesus was Israel's promised Messiah. That he would reign and rule and deliver and liberate Israel. And that through Israel, the Messiah would reign and nations would see the light of this Messiah, the glory of the Messiah, and people would come to know the Messiah. So Peter said, I, wait, no, 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 you, I don't want you to suffer. Jesus, you don't have to suffer. And, and that, for some reason, struck a nerve in Jesus. So much so that Jesus said, no, get behind me, Satan. Why do you think that is? I really believe that what struck Jesus' nerve was a correlation, a connection between what Peter said and how the devil himself tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The three temptations, the devil wanted Jesus to take a shortcut. Satan was tempting Jesus to bypass suffering. The first temptation is, hey, Jesus, you're pretty hungry, right? How about you turn the stone to bread? Like, like you don't need to trust the plans and the purposes and the provision of God. You're the son of God. Just feed yourself. Shortcut. The second temptation, the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. How they got there, I have no idea. Was there an elevator? I don't really know. <laughs> but they go on the top of the pinnacle of the temple, and, and the devil said, hey, just throw yourself down. But, hey, have your angels catch you, and people will applaud. They will praise you. The devil was tempting Jesus to take a shortcut to true praise and worship. But Jesus knew that true praise and worship would take place one day fully in the kingdom of God, but the, th the way through was through 
suffering, that there would be true praise and worship. That Jesus did not count equality with God as something to take advantage of, but Jesus, he humbled himself becoming a human, becoming a servant, becoming obedient, obedient, even obedient to the point of death. It was through his death then, Paul writes in Philippians 2, that he is exalted. He is Jesus, the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. But it was through suffering that glory, praise, and worship would truly happen because it was through suffering and death that he would redeem, release, and recover the captives, the enslaved. That he would redeem the sinners to become saints. It was through suffering, the last temptation. Satan just whispered in his ear saying, hey, take a shortcut. See all these kingdoms in the world. I can give him to you. No one has to know, but just worship me. And finally, Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. I will serve and worship God alone. I will be about his plans. I will be about his purposes. I will be about his provision. I will serve him alone. So when Peter starts talking about a shortcut to ignore suffering, to bypass suffering, suffering, to sidestep suffering. Jesus knew that that was not the plans and the purposes of God. Jesus said to, to Simon Peter, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What are the things of man? The things of man is all about what we can do and achieve in order to be living in convenience, to be comfortable, to have ease, to serve self, to sidestep suffering in order to be entering into glory without suffering. So many parts of the New Testament, Paul would write about how we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. We will glory with him, provided that we suffer with him. That through suffering, there is this exaltation and this, this experience, this reality of glory on the other side. So Peter, he... He tries to say to Jesus, hey, you don't have to suffer. And Jesus says, that's, mm -mm. Satan tried to say the same thing to me. I know that that's not the ways in the mind of God. That's the ways in the mind of how man operates. That I, I'm not about my own convenience. I'm not about my own comfort, my own ease. I'm not about doing what I do to just ignore suffering. Lastly, kind of a, a, a prelude to our main text this morning in verse 24, Jesus then says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And this is just the, the reality of we are to die to self. We are to die to our arrogance. We are to die to our pride. We are to die to our selfishness. We are to die to our jealousy. We are to die to all the things that he is redeeming us of and getting out of our lives. We are called to die to those things and to live a life full of the Holy Spirit, to live a life marked of righteousness, joy, and peace, to live a life dying to self, following Jesus. But my question to you is, where is Jesus going? Well, where did Jesus go all the time? Jesus went to the marginalized. Jesus went to the downcast. Jesus went to the hurting. Jesus went to the broken. Jesus went to those who felt like they had no other option. They had no hope. That's where Jesus would always go. So as we follow Jesus, it's not just following him to become like him. That is so beautifully true as well. We will follow in his footsteps. We want to live like him, look like him, love like him. But we must follow Jesus. And where Jesus goes, he goes to the hurting. Jesus said, I've not come to comfort, coddle, and spend time with those who already think themselves righteous. I've come for those who know that they're sinners. The healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Jesus would go to those who knew they were sick and they need healing. They needed hope. And so here we get to this main context, this main part 
that we're going to be focusing in on that I really believe speaks to us as the church, uh, to where God's leading us right now by his spirit. Chapter 17, it says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him, or appeared to them, Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Again, I really believe that, that part of why Peter spoke up in this moment, and we talked about a particular angle of what he said last night in last night's uh, evening service. But there's so many different angles to context, to scripture, and, and I believe another angle of why Peter spoke what he said was because he, he believed the kingdom of God was being inaugurated and being established in his very midst. Like, 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 like Jesus was transfiguring, he was, he was, man, his radiance, his magnificence, his brilliance was shining, showing, radiating from him. Peter probably thought, it's going down. The kingdom of God is being inaugurated, it's being established. Wait a minute, I just said that Jesus is the Christ, and upon that statement, that, 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 that proclaiming of that reality, that that's the foundation, the bedrock that he's going to build this church— Whoa, what if he's building his church right now? What if the bedrock, what if the foundation, what if the rock is this rock, this mountain that he's on, that we're on, and he's building his church and he's establishing his kingdom? Wait a minute, is it going down? Is it happening? And so he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to build shelters, I'm going to build tents for all three of you. Woo, yes, it's going down. But remember the context prior to this moment of transfiguration. Peter took Jesus aside and he, he encouraged Jesus. He said, well, suffering doesn't have to happen. Jesus said, no, 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 I, I do have to suffer and I do have to die and then I'll be raised. I will rise. Peter right here, he's still operating in the mindset of kingdom of God like like right here, right now, in the physical and the visible and the national sense. He's still thinking the things of man because he's thinking the kingdom of God is right here. Like, whoa, come on, it's right here, right now. When, when Jesus just said, like, no, 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 I, I have to suffer. Jesus had yet to suffer, and Peter still thought, it's glory time, baby. No, no, Jesus still needed to suffer. So after he proclaims this, and, and the Father speaking in the cloud of glory, saying, this is my son, I'm so proud of him, I'm so pleased with him, listen to him. Listen to him. Why do you think the Father said, listen to him? Well, after Peter's statement, I, I don't think Peter still quite got it. So the Father is saying, listen to what Jesus is saying. He's got to suffer, and then he will rise in glory and resurrection power kingdom of God will be inaugurated. It will be established. His kingdom will come, but it's going to come through the cross. It's going to come through death, and then comes resurrection. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John, they look up, and it's only Jesus. And where did Jesus take them? Where do they follow Jesus next? Scripture says that they went down the mountain. Wouldn't it have been just so easy for Peter, James, and John to set up camp on that mountain? To just memorialize that moment? To just be like, whoa, uh, this was awesome. This was sweet. Uh, let's stay here. No, no. Jesus then took them down the mountain. 
Jesus took him down the mountain because the path from the mountain was a path towards Jerusalem. It was towards Calvary. It was towards suffering. It was towards betrayal. It was towards being bruised and beaten and mocked. It was towards being crucified and it was towards being hanged on a tree between two thieves. That's where Jesus was headed. He was going to suffering. But before he went to suffer, he encountered a suffering boy. It says at the bottom of the mountain, a man came up to him. This is chapter 17, verse 14. And kneeling before him, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic. And he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Jesus was saying, like, how long until you realize I'm the answer? It's not in faith in what you do. You can't cast out that spirit. How long until you realize that all things are possible with me? until you place your faith in what I can do, until you place your faith in who I am. It's like, until that point, like, you're going to get things twisted. Faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. The boy was healed instantly. What's so powerful about the plans and the purposes of God is that we go through suffering. Whether it be suffering naturally, because we live in a broken, fallen, sinful world, or whether we suffer because we're standing up bold for our faith, or whether we suffer alongside people. Right? Because we've been talking about this lately. But Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You truly cannot weep with someone until you enter into their pain, until you understand their suffering, and until, in a certain sense, you were bearing their burden, carrying their burden, and until, in a certain sense, you were feeling their suffering and you're suffering with them. You cannot suffer with someone and expect to weep with them. You weep with them because you're suffering with them. You're entering into their world. You're entering into their pain, and you feel it, and you come alongside them, and you weep with them just as much as you would rejoice with them. It was through suffering that glory and hope and resurrection power would be a reality, not just in Jesus' resurrection, but a reality in us that we died with him and were raised with him. But we cannot have this hope and, and this healing until we recognize that we go through suffering and that Jesus went through suffering as well. Here's the reality. If, if Peter thought that the kingdom of God was just going to happen on the mountaintop without suffering, then they would have missed the opportunity to go down the mountain and to encounter a suffering boy. I'm so thankful that Jesus, Peter, and James, and John did not stay on top of the mountain, but they went down the mountain, and they traveled along the path of suffering, because on the path of suffering, they saw a boy that was afflicted. They saw a boy that was suffering, a dad who was desperate, and a dad who brought his boy before Jesus, saying, can you have compassion on us? We need help. We need help. I really believe that this three-month period of time, God is mobilizing the church. That the church, if people were to look for the church, they would not find the church in buildings. Where would, where would someone look and find the church? In and with families, in homes, by neighbors, in neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs, in communities. That's where the church was. 
I'm so thankful that the plans and the purposes of God was not just to sidestep suffering, but to enter into suffering. I'm so thankful that Jesus came down and humbled himself and entered into our broken state. He became our brokenness. He became our sin, he who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm so thankful that Jesus went to the marginalized, he went to the suffering, that Jesus did not stay as he sidestepped suffering on a mount of transfiguration, but that he went down the mount to meet a boy who is afflicted, a boy who is suffering, a boy who is being tortured by a demon. I believe that the last three months, God has mobilized the church to be out of buildings and with people, socially distanced, of course, but with people in homes and neighborhoods and cul-de-sacs. I'm so thankful that God has brought the church off of a mountain, out of buildings, away from programs, in with people. So much of what went down of how Jesus took Peter and James and John down from the mountain is I really believe what God has been doing with the church. Why? Because at the bottom of the mountain, a boy who was suffering was there waiting for Jesus. I believe God is teaching us and showing us and challenging us to go away from institutionalized church and to be the church. Ecclesia, which means church, was never meant to be about a building. Ecclesia means a people of God. We are to be the people of God on mission, mobilized, helping people experience and come to know Jesus. I'm so thankful that Jesus went to the bottom of the mountain because there he met someone who was hurting, broken, and in need of hope and healing. Jesus asked the boy's dad. This is actually found in Mark 9, in Mark's version translation and his words of what went down. In Mark 9, it's recorded that Jesus said, how long, how long has this been happening? That when Jesus said, bring the boy to me, the father was coming with the boy, and Jesus said, hey, how, how long has this been happening? <laughs> and the dad said, from childhood. I don't know how old this son was when he was presented before Jesus. But the way that the father said from childhood means that this, is, this has been a while. And Laurel Church, I'm just, I want us to not be so eager to overlook the suffering and overlook the hurting just to be back in the church. I want us to celebrate this moment of being back in the church knowing that there's so many broken and hurting people around us. Jesus just experienced a mountaintop moment and yet he wanted truly to step inside the world of this little boy. And he asked his dad, how long? How long has he been hurting? How long has this been going on? Church, as we look to be more about how can we go to them instead of saying, hey, you, you all should come to us. With this mindset of we are going to you, we will encounter people that are suffering, hurting, and broken. And I want us to mimic, I want us to imitate, I want us to follow the example of Jesus because Jesus said, how long has this been going on? Jesus wanted to hear the story. He wanted to know the situation. There will be hurting and broken people that I know God is calling Laurel Church to go and to minister to. Because we are about them, not about the comfort and ease about this building. We are about people. And that when we go to them, I want us to be like Jesus. And I want us to ask them, how long has this been going on? Tell me your story. I believe God has brought us to the bottom of the mountain to minister to the suffering and to the hurting out of the church building and being the church, we are to help those who are suffering. And I really believe that there are 
people who are like this boy, who are afflicted. And we are to go to them and hear their story and listen to them and weep with them and enter into their suffering and their world in order to point them and talk to them about Jesus. I know that there are men in this community that they have been addicted and they have been afflicted by the bondage of their lust, by the bondage of pornography. And just as the father said, oh, it's been happening from childhood, that there are chains and addictions in men's lives from childhood, from looking at a magazine, from being shown this, from participating in that. See, the beautiful thing about Jesus is Jesus wasn't stunned by the behavior of this boy. He saw that the boy was tortured and afflicted, and he asked more about it. When we are mobilized as, as the church to love people, to love our neighbor, to meet them where they're at, let us not be stunned by their behavior, but let us know that we need to hear their story. We need to be people of, that understand. Because there are men that have this behavior, they have this addiction, they have this affliction, but it started at, from childhood. Pornography, lust. There are so many within the black community, our black brothers and sisters, that they are crying out, we matter too, because of the amount of injustice that they felt that they have had throughout the years. And before we give our opinion, I want us to ask, how long have you felt this way? How can I better understand? How can I come alongside you? Can you tell me your story? There are those in this community that they are sexually confused about their orientation. And before we throw a stone, can we ask them of their story? Can we meet them where they're at? Can we seek to understand? Because just as the boy's father said from childhood, oftentimes one who is confused and one who is just, they have this internal battle of their sexual orientation, it starts from childhood. It starts by thinking thoughts and feeling feelings and being surrounded by pressure. We need to seek and understand where they're at. And as we enter into people's pain, we enter into people's suffering. We can share with them, hey, I don't judge you. I don't hate you. The church is not driving you out. We welcome you in. But let's just talk about the person of Jesus. Because church, let's be real. Us wagging our finger at them is not going to produce life change. You know what's going to produce life change? Jesus. So we talk about Jesus. We have Jesus in the forefront and in the center and as the foundation of all that we do. It is by knowing Jesus and being in a relationship with him, that is what produces life change. I say all of this and I read this text because I don't want to sidestep what is inconvenient, what is uncomfortable, what is awkward, what is hard, what is challenging. Because all of those things describe the emotions and the feelings that we have when we try to enter into other people's worlds, into other people's suffering. It's not an easy thing to do. You know what the easy thing is to do? Woo! Church is open. We bypass all that, and we come here and we celebrate. Now, there is a time and a place for this. We will not neglect meeting together as a family of God. This is so brutally important. We're not going to cut this out by any means. 
obviously, we were made for relationship, right? We were made as the body to be united and to function together. So um, we're going to continue to be Saturday night, Sunday morning. But now that we're back, I don't want to forsake the lessons that I believe God was teaching the church during this three-month span and what he's going to continue to, to teach the church moving forward. I believe that the game has changed. I believe that we are down from the mountain and out of buildings in such a way where we recognize, whoa, church was much more than a service. Ch church it's the people of God meeting people where they're at, pointing them to the person of Jesus. You know what awaits us as we are walking down the mountain towards the bottom of the mountain? A broken crowd full of broken, in need individuals. I'm not going to memorialize the past. I'm going to celebrate the past. But it's not going to be time to memorialize the past because God has mobilized the church in this season. Isaiah 43 says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing, and it springs forth now. Do you perceive it? And I want us to perceive and to participate in the new ways that God is opening our eyes and opening our hearts to see in order to reach and raise up the next generations of followers of Jesus. And it starts by stepping outside of our comfort zone. It starts by stepping off of the mountain. It starts by stepping out of the building and meeting people where they're at. Can you guys pray with me? And then I think the Worship team's got a couple other songs. Lord God, help us. Help us to forsake and forget the ways of man and help us to have the mindset of God. Help us to embrace the awkward, the uncomfortable, the challenging, the difficult. Help us to embrace these things as we step inside people's worlds, as we walk to the bottom of the mountain, as we enter into people's realities, their lives. I just think of the words that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, that he becomes all things to all people so that by the grace of God, he might win some over. And God, part of that list of becoming all things to all people, Paul includes, to the weak I become weak. And God, I... I don't want to think myself as high and mighty. I want to think myself as, as weak so that I can reach the weak, the broken, the hurting, the suffering. Meeting them where they're at. Loving our actual physical neighbors and our neighborhoods. God, you waste nothing. You have not wasted the last three months. You have been teaching us, equipping us, challenging us and mobilizing us to recognize that we are more than a people who go to church. We are the church and we're called to be the church. I thank you that Peter didn't have the time to build shelters on top of that mountain because from that mountain, Jesus, you were showing them to be the shelter to do more than just build shelters, to be the shelter for people, to be the invitation to hope and healing in the person of Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the church. God, we thank you for the minutes and the moments that we've shared here Sunday morning, and we thank you for this time that we can gather together 
this is not the mission, but that we gather together to remember the mission. The mission is outside these walls. Interacting with the people we come in contact with. Thank you, God, for challenging us and rethinking the priorities, rethinking the mission, rethinking church in the, in, the, in the ways of how we function and why we do what we do. Thank you for mobilizing us. God, I ask that you supernaturally supply and equip us with the courage and boldness to not just hear this message, but to embrace this and to live this out in the small, practical, relational ways with the people around us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. Amen. Yeah. 
in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. So on your, the table, you'll see communion. And on the night that he was betrayed, our father took the bread and broke it and said, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he said, take the cup and drink. This is my blood shed for you. <laughs> Do this in remem remembrance of me. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire. Kingdom first, we come. 
let's all help. Let's be the church. Have a blessed week. Enjoy.